and thank you all for coming today. Appreciate uh, your interest in the story. Some of you uh, are shareholders, and thank you for your support. Uh, before I get started, I always like to remind people that I won't lie, cheat, or steal, at least not unless it's in uh, support of the shareholders. Uh, but you shouldn't either, and I will be having forward-looking statements today. Uh, I believe they're true, but you shouldn't take my word for it. You should do your own work. Um, the recent transaction uh, between Ianthus and MPX uh, is really a landmark transaction within the industry. Uh, we actually had a vote yesterday. Uh, I think 40% of the uh, shareholders voted in person or for proxy and voted uh, close to 100% in favor of the transaction. We should have this closed uh, by the end of the month. Uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's, but uh, it is a, a tremendous deal. It puts us into 11 states, um, gives us over 120 million potential customers. We have the ability to open 63 dispensaries, uh, almost 600,000 square feet of cultivation, and gives us a billion dollar uh, U.S. market cap on a pro forma basis. Uh, it really changes uh, both companies uh, as a united front puts us into a top tier on a size and scale basis. Uh, there's a huge growth opportunity within the U.S. Uh, we continue to have a leading capital markets in M&A position, and we think we have a proven management team that knows how to execute and pull all this together. Uh, there are three keys to success in the U.S. cannabis market. You have to be able to acquire a footprint, you have to be able to fund that growth, and you have to have a team that can replicate state by state by state. From a, uh, a growth potential, and this will get into why the footprint's so important, um, the growth within this industry is unprecedented. Currently today, you have about an eight or nine billion uh, legal market that's growing. The estimate now is 75 billion to, in uh, uh, 2030 by some of the, uh, the industry analysts. But I happen to think that those forecasts really underserve what the growth potential within this industry can be. Today, cannabis has about a $55 billion market size. That's both the black market and the legal market. That represents about an 11% penetration of the adult population on regular usage, de defined as twice a month. If you take the same concept of regular usage from alcohol, that's about 55% penetration. Our supposition is that in the next 10 years, the penetration of cannabis will look a lot like alcohol. That implies a four to five times growth of the 50 to 60 billion, that could get you close to 200 billion or north from a revenue perspective 10 years from now. So then the question is, what's that worth? Because cannabis operators can own both the retail, the brand, and the distribution, companies that can do that typically trade at five to six times revenue. That's a trillion dollars of market cap that's available for uh, the participants in this market. So then you have to say, who's going to partake of that trillion dollars? Well, if cannabis looks anything like a normal industry, the top players are going to control 80% of that, the old 80-20 rule. Who are those top players? Because of the uh, restricted license nature of the ability to sell to consumers in most of your large states, in New York, or Florida, uh, New Jersey, um, there's not a lot of people who are going to have that national footprint and be that national player. You can run the Venn diagram math, it's going to be about 10 players. So 10 players are going to compete for $800 billion of market cap 10 years from now. You know who those 10 players are. You can just go up under your, your ticker screen and see who they are today. You can take that $800 billion, discount it back to today at whatever discount rates you want in the entire sector is four to five times undervalued today. The wealth creation that's going to occur in this transfer from bad guys to good guys is unprecedented in the capital markets. That's why having a national footprint is so key to success as an MSO in the United States. Um, that implies that you have to be good at M&A. You have to be able to do a deal. It's highly unlikely you're going to be able to apply your way into 50 states. So you have to be able to be good at acquisitions. This is a hallmark of Ianthus. It's a hallmark of uh, MPX. Together, we've done more transactions than anybody, uh, close to 17, 10 of which we've done since January 2018. The other piece is you need to be able to finance this. You need to be very strong at capital markets. The combined companies have raised over $330 million, U.S. dollars. Um, and there's some other components of that capital markets piece. 
You have to be able to report in a timely fashion. You have to have transparency to your financials. We have eight quarterly reviews, two full yearly audits. Together, we have over 30,000 shareholders globally. We've raised capital across four continents. We have big private investors. We know how to raise money. We have continued access to capital to continue to build out that footprint as we acquire it. One of the things you have to think about, too, if you're going to be in the capital markets are, have you built the company to be a public company? Or was it built as a private company that happened to take a sliver public, and you have what I call syndicate risk between your private shareholders who, you know, they need to mark to market at some point, and your public shareholders are buying on the margin. Both MPX and Ianthus were built as public companies. We're seasoned. We've been public for over two and a half years. The people who are in our stock want to be in the stock. There isn't a big backlog of private investors who are going to try and uh, mark to market at some point in the next couple of years. You need to have an experience and proven management to pull this together. Uh, myself and Julius, our CFO, have raised over $50 billion in our careers. We know how to get the financings done from a regulatory and strategic perspective. My partner, uh, Randy, who is a co-founder of the company, uh, has been involved in highly regulated business, businesses for decades. He knows how to see around corners. He knows how to ensure the structures are put in place in a manner that can create shareholder value. Uh, very excited to have just added Beth Stavola uh, to our team in the merger with MPX. She's um, uh, just a dynamo, one of the leaders within the world of cannabis. Uh, she built one of the leading cannabis businesses based out of Arizona while she was raising six kids in New Jersey. She can get stuff done. Tremendous addition to the team. Go across on the operational side, you have to be able to replicate state by state by state. If you want to have a national brand, the chocolate has to taste the same in Massachusetts as it does in Florida. You have to have a team that's done this before. You're not going to go and find someone in the cannabis business who's built a multi-state business because it hasn't happened. You have to find people who have done this in other businesses and teach them the cannabis business. So someone like Carlos, our COO, Director of Manufacturing from Intel, he's made billions of things look exactly the same. Uh, Pat Tiernan, President of our Western Region, COO of one of the largest craft brewery companies uh, on the planet. He's sold the same beer in 30 countries. John Henderson, president of our eastern region. He was the um, president of Macumber Construction Services for the better part of a decade. He was my COO at my last company. He's built out millions of square feet of uh, healthcare and tech facilities that all look the same. Now, just you have to push down from that piece as well. It's not, it's not just enough to have leadership. You have to have a team that thinks this way. You need to have best practices. You need to have arcane things like Six Sigma, management by objective. One key piece within this industry doesn't get a lot of conversation. If you're going to be successful, you have to be able to measure. You have to have an ERP system that you can benchmark across all these. We are doing all this. It's repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, we've proven that we have the ability to scale quickly. A lot of our competitors in the marketplace, very successful, but they've been in business for 10 years. They start off as private companies. They've been growing quite nicely for 10 years. I happen to think that uh, many of those I own in my own portfolio. I think we're all going the same direction. But that ability to scale, I think, is going to differentiate. You go back two years, we were in four states. We had uh, 40 employees, and we had assets of $41 million. And you look where we are today, we're 11 states, we've got close to 400 employees, and we have assets that have increased 10x in that two-year period. And the markets recognize this piece, albeit with a little volatility. But uh, over the last 12 months, our stock is up uh, twofold. So the market has uh, recognized that and rewarded us for it. Going forward, the strategy is exactly as I described it. Continue to expand uh, the geographic footprint, continue to finance that, uh, replicate the processes, and build 100-year brands. Uh, one of the things as an investor you want to make sure is that there's momentum in the stock, that there's transparency in what's going to happen. We have a lot of good news coming out in 2019. We'll have the o um, uh, <laughs> flagship openings, Staten Island, Miami, Las Vegas. Uh, we're taking the MPX branded products uh, into Nevada and into California. Uh, from a dispensary perspective, we have 16 leases signed in Florida. Uh, that's over 45,000 square feet of floor space. Those will be opening throughout the year. Massachusetts will have five additional dispensary openings in addition to our store in Boston. 
three more in New York in addition to our store in Brooklyn that just opened up, and the list goes on. We also have some regulatory uh, and application things. There'll be adult use in New Jersey, Massachusetts, Vermont. Cuomo just came out with some comments yesterday in New York. Uh, and they'll probably have uh, uh, adult use ballot initiatives in Arizona and New Mexico. Um, and there's some political drivers as well. You know, the, the wind at the, the back of our sails is quite good. Uh, there's a lot of legislation that has been stymied by the Republicans over the last two years. Now the Dems are in charge of the House, and we should see some of that legislation move forward. may not get passed, but the discussion will occur. That will give people more comfort. That should reduce the volatility uh, of the investments, and that should uh, reduce the cost of capital, which should all be good news for investors. Um, we are a leader in cultivation and processing. Uh, you know, some of these announcements will come out over the course of 2019, but as we build out what we have available, uh, it will be close to 600,000 square feet of capacity. Uh, from a retail perspective, and retail does drive revenues, people always say, oh, what are you going to make in 2019, 2020? Many have heard me say this. I have no idea. <laughs> I shouldn't really be saying that as the CEO of a company, but it really depends when you can get the stores open. And there's, there's obviously the usual building risk, but then there's a regulatory piece when you can get ins inspected, you know, when someone shows up. But as those stores open, they generate significant amounts of revenue. If you have a well-located store in what I would call an oligopoly-type market without a lot of competition, you can do 10 to $15 million out of a store. So when you see us announce a store opening, you know that's ramping over the next 12 months, that type of revenue. That should give you a good sense of what the revenue growth potential is for the company. Um, one of the comments we get is, wow, you've got all these brands. You've grown by acquisition. What are you going to do? We are going to have one retail brand. Shortly after the MPX transaction closes, we'll be announcing what that name is. The existing stores will open under that brand, uh, or the existing stores will be retrofitted to that brand, and the new stores will open under that brand. Uh, we also are creating a focused brand approach. Uh, we'll, lead, we'll create leading national product brands. There'll be one in-store brand, and we'll curate our other brands from an in-store perspective, as well as third-party uh, product in states where it's allowed. Um, one of the brands that we have right now, MPX, this is uh, tremendous. Doesn't that just look beautiful? It looks like something from a, uh, a James Bond film or something with the gold and all. I love that. But award-winning brand, uh, great distribution. You know, Beth has uh, pushed this out into uh, 90, uh, 90 stores across three states. Uh, and it sells quite well from a brand perspective, and we're likely to take that and put that through our East Coast network as well. Um, so when you come right down to it and you look at it, we like to think that uh, we have the best odds at the starting line. This, this isn't a sprint. This is actually a marathon. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the New York Marathon. We're all kind of on the Verrazano Bridge. It's a little too premature to say who's going to be running through Central Park with the laurel leaf. Um, but we think that we're pretty well possessioned. If you compare us to uh, an average of uh, uh, our peers, we're in a similar number of states, have the ability to open a similar number of dispensaries, and yet we trade at a 55% discount to where they are. We think we've been great value to our shareholders um, from a potential uh, wealth creation over the course of 2019. Um, so uh, just, just a few final points before I open up for a little Q&A. Uh, the combination puts us into a new position within the industry. You really have to be north of a billion dollars of market cap to have relevance. We saw this in the Canadian markets where the people had a billion dollars or more of market cap traded at three times the multiples of those uh, below that. From a uh, growth opportunity, it's really unprecedented. I think you'll see the analysts continue to bring their forecasts up, up, up. It's already gone from like 70 billion to 80 billion to 90. I think it goes much further than that. I mean, once, once this is legal on a federal basis and the food scientists and Prosper and Gamble come in, you're just going to have products that you can't even imagine. And you're just going to take, uh, take share away from uh, the adult beverage business and you're going to create new categories that create additional growth for cannabis. Uh, you have to be good at capital markets. You have to be good at m and It's got nothing to do with cannabis. This is a skill set that is a um, uh, base to your success rate in the industry. And we've got that uh, in spades. And you have to have a management team that can replicate. And we can do that. But we think we're very well positioned. I appreciate uh, all your interest. And uh, I have four minutes and 49 seconds for questions. Yes, sir. Uh, 
not very well marked. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the different product categories and where do you see drill, drill value creation and flower better than top. I think the question is talk about product categories and where you can see value created. I guess I'd step back and say, first we have to delight our customers. So we will deliver the product that the customer asks for. Uh, what we've seen in many markets, and if you go back five, six years, it was all about flour that has shifted to what I would call broadly derivative products that would include um, you know, your edibles and your vapes and whatnot. And that represents 60% you know, of sales in some markets. Um, from our perspective, we think that that is a, uh, you know, that's a good trend. Uh, it provides a higher margin product. It provides an opportunity for creating a brand, much more so than flour. Flour is a strength component to the details that's a strength brand against. So we see that as a, uh, uh, a good uh, a good trend, and we think that that will continue. I think if you look forward 10 years, you'll always have a flower piece, but it will be uh, you know, a minority of, of your overall sales. Uh, I think you'll see in the next, uh, you know, maybe even five years, actual beverages that uh, uh, actually taste good and have good uptake and good outtake. I think that will be a, a killer product set that will uh, sort of redefine some of the uh, <coughs> some of the new entrants who come into the market. Other questions? I couldn't have covered everything. Yes? I'm Donna Shields, Forest to Canvas Academy. Um, I worked a little bit for a health day one of your brands here in Florida. Thank you. Um, and they're doing a great job. She's done a good job for all the things? Yes. Thumbs up. She gets a thumbs up. Um, can you speak a little bit about uh, your company's interest in the office space and how you see that really playing into the terms of all that? Oh, sure. That's a great question. The question is how does uh, wellness play within the um, uh, the world of brand and cannabis, and it really is a continuum. I, I get the question all the time, oh, what about rec, what about medical? And I say, well, it's really a continuum. I don't think about it that way. I think that's a, a legal distinction the regulators have put in place. The same person who gets up on Monday and may microdose through the day for a sore back is the same person who buys something on a Friday to relax with his or her friends. So it's a continuum. People approach the plant uh, in a variety of different ways depending upon um, sort of what endpoint use they want. From a wellness perspective, uh, I think that's one of the big usage pieces. I think that's probably one of the bigger components if you take it from that 11% penetration today to where we might see that 50, 55% penetration a decade from now. The health and wellness piece of it is huge. You know, I think that um, you know, if you think about it, health and wellness, nutraceutical, that piece, whether you're, you're going with high CBD, even some THC, you, you know, you're going to find that that's a big growth growth piece of the market. And I think it, it naturally has to be if you're going to get to that type of penetration. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Frank, plans for Miami Beach? In the works. I take it you would go to the one in Miami Beach? OK. We'll, we'll keep you posted. Other questions? We've got one minute and 16 seconds left. <laughs> OK, well, I will uh, I'm here all day. I'll be out in the hallway, uh, post this. Uh, oh, wait, I have one. This is the, the, late, the late bloomer in the back there. Yes, sir. What have you have done in Nevada? What have we done in Nevada? Um, we have uh, uh, a grow facility processing, and we were just awarded uh, uh, four uh, dispensary licenses. Um, to date, it's a wholesale strategy. Uh, the MPX brand is manufactured there, and we sell into um, probably 30 storefronts now. It actually gets asked for by name. We've had a lot of good uh, traction, and the revenue is ramping very quickly in that marketplace. But we're very excited uh, that Beth and the team won those four, ap uh, four applications for retail locations. And we should have, depending upon uh, the politics, two to four of those stores open in the next 12 months. So that's, that's all the time I have. Thank you very much for your trust and support, and I'll, I'll be here all day. Thanks.